So let's first talk about <clears throat> all of the trig functions, really. They cycle, right? And so if I start here at zero and go around, it's just going to keep cycling. And so when you start to graph these on an xy plane, then you start to see a cycle. Um, and so what we're actually looking at when we start graphing is we're going to be looking at plugging in the x value, which will be our radians, and then getting out the output, which will be whatever function we're talking about. So like if my function was sine, my output would be the sine at that radian. If my function was cosine, the output would be the cosine at that particular radian, okay? And so if I put an input of pi over four, that would be my horizontal axis input. My output, my, my vertical axis would be square root of two over two, sine, sine of pi over four, okay? And so then you start plotting these on a coordinate plane and you start seeing that you have, like for sine and cosine, a wave. Um, and so, on page 197, you'll see an example of just the straight sine function and the straight cosine function. If I were to plug in zero into sine, I would get zero. If I were to plug in pi over two into sine, I would get one. If I were to plug in pi, I would get zero. Three pi over two would give me negative one and two pi would give me zero. And you see that you create this wave that happens, okay? You create a wave. They give you some information, it is continuous. Um, it oscillates, so it literally just goes back and forth, right? It, it goes back and forth. It doesn't move towards a specific point as you get to infinity. It just goes back and forth between 1 and negative 1, your just standard sine function. It's symmetric to the origin. You can see that it crosses here and is mirrors across. You have specific zeros that happen for both sine and cosine. Max and min's happen um, really cycles. I mean, you have a max here, a min here, a max here, a min here. It just keeps going. Um, and they are relative, obviously, because you keep doing it. If you look at cosine, cosine looks just like your sine graph. It's just moved by a quarter, pretty much. Because if you start at zero and plug that into cosine, you get one. Pi over two gives you a zero. Pi gives you a negative one. And three pi over two gives you a zero. And so what I typically do is I look at these as just a chunk, right? A period which we'll talk about that term. If you take this guy and just repeat it, you will get your sine graph, okay? And so there are a couple things to remember about sine. You start at your midpoint there, your midline. You can see that this is the middle of the graph here. You're gonna start here. You're gonna go to your highest point. You're gonna go back to your middle, lowest point, and back to your middle. So you start at your middle, one fourth of the way through you're high, halfway through you're back at your middle, three-fourths of the way through, you're at the low, and you end at the middle. This is what happens on the sine graph. Cosine graph just shifts it. So for cosine, we're going to start here and end here again, right? You'll notice you start at the peak, go to your middle at one-fourth, halfway through, you're at the valley, three-fourths of the way through, you're back to your middle, and you end at your peak or your highest point, all right? This is cosine graph. Let's look at some terms. Amplitude. All right, so amplitude is how high you get from the middle. All right, standard graph is just one. But you can multiply these by some constant. And so your amplitude is how far you go from the middle to the crest and the middle to your base here. It is found by, here it is right here, absolute value of A. So if you look at your function and you have y equals some number times sine or y equals some number times cosine, your amplitude is going to be the absolute value of a. So that's the first thing on this, absolute value of a. Ampli deter amplitude determines how far the gra graph goes up and down from the midline, from the midline. All right, how far it goes up and down from the midline. It says state the amplitude, then describe how it's obtained by transforming the parent function, and then graph it, all right? So <clears throat> if we look at this guy, my amplitude is the absolute value of the number in front of my sine. So my amplitude here is going to be equal the absolute value of negative 1 half, which is just 1 half. 
Now, what does this tell me? Well, this tells me that the furthest I'm gonna get from my middle is going to be one half. So if I take this, I am gonna graph it the same. The only shifting that has happened is my amplitude, all right? So for sine, I am gonna start at zero. This is my one fourth, this is my halfway, this is my three fourths, this is my end, okay? So we wanna break it up into fourths, all right? Start, finish, halfway, and then half each one of those. But now instead of going to one, I'm only gonna to go to one half. So I'm gonna start at my zero and one fourth of the way through, I'm only gonna go there because my amplitude is one half. Halfway through, I'm gonna be back at my middle. At my three quarter mark, I'm gonna be at my lowest, which is now negative one half. And then I'm gonna go back over. This says all the way to negative two pi. So if I went the other direction, left side, I'm gonna go down and back up and then back down, all right? And so my graph is gonna be this wave that happens when I connect those points. And it's a wave, it's not an absolute value, all right? That's all that's happening. I'm taking my sine graph and I'm just squishing it by one half. If it had been three, it would have been really tall, right? and I would have gone that far away. The period of a periodic function is the horizontal length of one cycle. So normally it takes an entire circle for your sine graph to um, go completely in one cycle, all right? There are things that can affect this. And so um, this would be called the period. So normally the period is going to be two pi, but that period can be affected by something being multiplied. Now we're looking at what is multiplying inside here. Inside, what's multiplying by our x here? And so the formula for finding period is two pi over the absolute value of b. So your period equals two pi over the absolute value of b, and it determines how long it takes for the graph to complete one cycle. One cycle, okay? How long it takes to complete one cycle one cycle. So 2 pi over the absolute value of b and how long it takes to complete one cycle. Basically, the period can be measured as the distance between adjacent maximum points or adjacent minimum points. So how long it takes to get from peak to peak or valley to valley. And that's true for sine or cosine, right? The measurement between your peaks and your valleys will be your period. Because by the time you get to another peak, you're starting over. All right, by the time you get to your second valley, you're starting over, okay? And so you can see the difference between your peaks and your valleys, that should equal your period. All right, state the amplitude and period of the sky, then describe how it is obtained by transforming the parent function over this, all right? And so for this one, we actually have a higher um, amplitude, so we're gonna do this one a little bit different. All right, now they want us to do the amplitude and the period, the amplitude and the period, all right? So my amplitude, that's gonna be the number in front of my function. Well, in this case, the absolute value of three is three. My period, my period is going to be two pi over the absolute value of the guy in front of my x. Well, that's negative two, so that's over two. So my period here is just pi, which means I'm gonna complete an entire cycle in half the time, all right? So how do I graph this? Well, if my period is pi, I'm gonna start at zero and I'm gonna end at pi. That's my starting and ending. On the other side of that, because they want to go, they actually want me to do multiple cycles, but we'll, we'll get it done, all right? So that's what each period should look like, from zero to pi, pi to two pi or from negative two pi to negative pi to, to, to zero to pi to two pi. Every one of those, I'm gonna have an entire cycle of a cosine function, all right? When I do this, I want to divide those up. So I'm gonna take from zero, right, from zero to pi, and I'm gonna cut it in half, all right? So I'm gonna cut each one of these in half if I'm gonna do multiple cycles here, which is what it wants me to do. So I'm gonna cut all of these in half. I need a halfway mark. 
and I need my quarter marks, which means I'm gonna take all those halfway marks and cut those in half, right? So I'm gonna cut this in half, right? All of these in half will give me my quarter marks there. All right, so that's all my quarter marks. Cut it in half, cut it in half again. And then we're just gonna do our cosine function, all right? Cosine starts at my peak. In this case, my amplitude is three. So I'm gonna start three away from this right here. So I'm gonna actually gonna start this guy up here at three, all right? <clears throat> For a cosine graph, halfway through I'm at my midline, or a quarter of the way through I'm at my midline. So quarter of the way, my quarter mark, I'm gonna be back at my middle. At the halfway mark, I'm gonna be at my lowest. My lowest in this case is negative three. So at the halfway mark, I'm gonna be here at negative three. Three quarters of the way back at middle, I end at my peak. It wants me to do multiples, so if I kept doing that, I would go back down and back up, right? Here I would go back down and back up, right? So you can just keep going, it's a cycle. And once again, this is a curve, it's not an absolute value. And so you're just cycling up and down. All right, questions on the period. All right, and it keeps going. So one cycle is from here to here. That should be one pi apart. You can check it, because all of your peaks should be one pi apart. All of your valleys should be one pi apart, because that's what you told me your period was.
Term hertz formally replaced cycles per second. Hertz this should sound familiar from like what do y'all what do y'all do hertz in chemistry physics somewhere in there. All right, um, it's a cycle talking about radio waves, right? Um, German physicist Heinrich Hertz, who in 1888 became the first person to transmit and receive radio waves, thus confirming their existence. It was theoretical until that point. Theoretical, they thought this was possible. They proved it mathematically, but they had never actually proven it by um, experiment. And so he was the first one. So it was actually um, given him. He was named after it. And this I found interesting too. It's on the next page. Karl Hertz, who is the son of um, the original guy, um, was instrumental in developing medical ultrasound equipment. Uh, so this is, you know, ultrasounds are used in prenatal care, which, um, you know, up until they had this, there was a lot of information they did not know, which they've come a long way since he did this, obviously, clearly. But, um, you know, they can tell even now issues that the child is having in the womb because of this technology that he would have been a part of. So, so we've already talked about amplitude and period, all right? Some things you can do, because there's two ways to look at the next couple that we're looking at. Um, frequency is actually just a flip of your period. I wanna point this out. I don't usually ask for frequency when I'm giving you a problem, um, but I do want you to know that you'll hear the word frequency, especially in your sciences. Um, it's just the inverse of your period. Um, your frequency just really tells you how many times, like it's a unit for each cycle. It's just flipped. And so when you hear the term frequency, like for radio stations or for pitches or whatever, it's talking about, right, how many, how long it takes to do a period. And so then frequency is like, well, how many periods do I have in this particular? And so the higher the pitch, you'll see uh, more frequency or the lower the pitch, the fewer um, cycles you'll have in one. And so Frequency is a term that you're going to hear in science, but know that it relates to period. It is just the reciprocal of your period. The other two I want to talk about is phase shift and vertical shift. These are your vertical and horizontal movements. So phase shift is what moves you left and right. Vertical shift moves you up and down. There's a couple ways to do this. If your um, function looks like this. So let's say we have f of x equals a times the sine of this bx uh minus your c is what it usually says and then i always wrote it that way so that's what it looks like on yours um you're gonna have to take your um negative c and put it over your b to find your phase shift so this can be negative b over c i mean negative c over b or it can be h the difference is with H, they have factored out their B, okay? So there's two ways you'll see this written. One, you'll see the B on the inside, like that, okay? If it's on the inside, you have to do your division, negative C over B, okay? If it's already on the outside, it's already been taken out, okay? And all you have to do is typically negate it because your, your formula up here is already a negative, all right, so that means take the opposite of whatever is in there, okay? So if it's negative inside, you're just gonna use the H. If it's a positive inside, you're gonna say negative H, right? You're still gonna use your negative here. So, you know, because it's already a minus, keep in mind you are gonna to have to think about what this is. It's the opposite of what you think it would be. When it's factored out like this, this is the same type of movement you would have in anything. Remember in a parabola, if it's on the inside, it moves it left and right but opposite, right? So minus moves it right, positive moves it left, okay? And that's the same here. So if you go ahead and factor out your B, then you don't have to worry about doing the division. But if your B is on the inside, you do have to negate it, right? And you have to um, divide, and that's gonna move, move your shift. If it's already set up like this, then you just have to worry about moving it left and right. But it is opposite of what you would think, okay? Because your subtraction is already in there. Your plus or minus on the outside is your vertical shift. That just moves you up and down, exactly how you would think. A positive moves the whole thing up, a negative moves the whole thing down. So your amplitude is going to be the distance away from that line. So if you have already moved up or down, then you take your amplitude from that guy, okay? So if it's not on the axis, the x-axis, I will usually draw, draw a dotted line so that as I'm graphing along, I know where to put it.
Okay, so let's look at a couple of these examples. Amplitude period and phase shift of this little guy right here. And he has all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and we're going to graph it. And they are graphing this from 2 pi to 4 pi, negative 2 pi to 4 pi, just because my period is going to be a little bit longer. As we go through this, we're going to do it one piece at a time. Um, the amplitude. The amplitude is going to be the guy in front of sign. What's in front of sign if you don't see anything? It's just a one. My period. All right. So my period, I my B is on the inside. That actually doesn't matter for period. Okay. So um, it either way, I'm going to say 2 pi over. Let's look and see. Pi, X over 2. What's in front of the X? Yeah. So 2 pi over 1 half, right? Everybody see that? So keep change flip, 2 pi times 2, this guy's going to be 4 pi, all right? Phase shift. So my B is actually inside there, okay? My B is inside there. So my C here is pi over 4. And I go ahead and negate it because it tells me which way I'm moving if I do that because I'm going to move left here over my B because my B has not been taken out. So what is my B here? One half. So keep change flip. It's going to be negative pi over two. I'm going to move left pi over two. Okay. If I factored it out, by the way, let's say I factored it out. I would pull a one half out here. X and factoring it out is dividing. So if I factored that out, then I would say pi over 4 divided by 1 half times 2 over. So this would be plus pi over 2. And you can see that this guy would be a negative pi over 2 shift, right? It's a left shift. Does that make sense? So factoring it out, you can see it's immediately the opposite of this guy. Not factoring out, you're just dividing because that's what would happen if you factored it out. All right. And then vertical shift. My vertical shift is just the guy on the outside, so it's going to be 2, which means my midline here is going to be y equals 2. It's a horizontal line, all right? So typically when I graph these, I go to my midline, and I just do this little dashed line here so that I know where I'm starting from, all right? The next thing I'm going to think about is this is a sine graph. It's a sine graph. So I know I'm going to start at my midline, go up, down, back down and back up. But I have a phase shift. So that means before I ever start, I have to move it left or right. So now my starting point is no longer zero. Normally I would start right here at zero and do my little sine graph. I have to go back according to this guy. So I actually am gonna start right here, okay? So I'm starting right here and I'm ending wherever my cycle ends. So my cycle ends at one period. So I'm going to end 4 pi away from here, 4 pi away from here. And my graph's not big enough. So y'all are actually going to have to use the graphs on the back side of your handout. All right, so if I start at pi over 2 and I have to go 4 pi, I'm going to add it. Negative pi over 2. So if I have a negative 1 half plus a 4, I should go all the way to 3 and a half pi, right? Or 7 pi over 2 is another way to write that guy, Okay. So I'm actually going to go, I'm going to end way out here at 7 pi over 2. So this is my starting and this is my ending, right? Everybody see that? I'm going to cut it in half. How many blocks did I go? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 blocks, right? So halfway through is going to be at 8 blocks. I mean, I'm just estimating. All right, so... This is going to be my halfway. You can do it mathematically. Obviously, you can take those two. You can add two pi to this guy. You're going to get three and a half pi, right? Um, but you're really just looking at how far we have to go, which means my quarter marks are going to be here. All right, my quarter marks are going to be here. So just make sure you know your ending, your halfway marks, and your quarter marks, because that's what we're going to do here. All right? And then we're just going to graph it. For sine graph, we start at my midline. So I'm going to start at my midline here. My midline's right there. All right? Amplitude is 1. 
So I'm gonna go for my quarter mark here, I'm gonna be one away from that middle line, which is at three. So my quarter mark is going to be here, one away. All right, halfway mark, I should be back at my midline. Three quarter marks, I should be down to my lowest, that's one away from my midline going down. And then I'm going to end back at my midline, okay? So it's gonna look like this. Of course, it would keep going that way and it would keep going that way. All right, write an equation of a sine function passing through the point negative three, zero with a period of five and an amplitude of two. Amplitude's easy. easy. There's actually two options. You can actually have multiple graphs that fit this description, by the way, for a little bit. Um, the negative three is going to help us. But um, really, uh, amplitude of two means that the absolute value of two is going to be in front of it, you know, either two or negative two. So if we just use two, we know that two is going to be my amplitude because they told us that. So I'm gonna start with this guide. I know that my amplitude is gonna be two. We'll just use that, <clears throat> positive or negative two, but we'll let it be two. <clears throat> period is five. Well, period equals two pi over b, and they're telling me that equals five. I can solve for b, can't I? Multiply and divide, which means b is going to be two pi over five. Okay, make sense? I know that my, my period is 2 pi over b, so if 2 pi over b equals 5, just solve for b, all right? Um, and then they tell me negative 3, it passes through the point negative 3. So if it passes through negative 3, 
zero, then I'm gonna have to shift the graph three, right? And it means I'm gonna have to shift the gra graph three places to the left, which means on the inside, it needs to look like a plus three, all right? So when I'm writing this graph, I would say, well, my function is going to equal two times the sine of um, my b, which is two pi over five, and I'm gonna leave him out here. Two, three units to the left is gonna be a plus three. Um, it did not give me a vertical shift, so I'm gonna assume I don't have one. You could leave it like that, or you could distribute, but this is what my function will look like, okay? So you just figure out what your a, b, c, and d are, and then just plug them in, all right? Questions? Tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Sine and cosine are continuous functions. There is no point on the unit circle where sine and cosine are undefined. That is not true for the other four. The reason that it's not true for the other four is because those are in relation to your sine and cosine. And since there are times when sine and cosine are zero, and these functions have one of those in the denominator, then you have times when these are undefined. So you have these vertical asymptotes that occur. You can see the sine and cosine graphs here. This is your tangent graph, and you can see it negative pi over two and pi over two, it is undefined. Why? Because sine, remember, I mean, t tangent right here is sine over cosine. Well, every time your cosine is zero, you have a problem with your tangent graph when you're graphing it. So at every time that your cosine is zero, you're gonna see an asymptote. And so instead of being this wave, it actually looks almost like a cubit function is what it looks like if you remember your cubit function, okay? Looks kind of like a cubit function. And so you're going towards infinity this way and towards infinity that way, and then you jump over your asymptote. And so your, tr your tan function looks like this. Your cotangent is really just your inverse of that guy. And so he looks like a negative x cubed is what he looks like, actually. All right. So he has um, asymptotes where your sine is zero because that's your denominator on a cotangent graph. And so your cotangent looks like this guy. Your secant and cosecant also have issues. All right. Secant is when your cosine is zero. We have a problem, right? Um, cosecant is when your sine is zero, we have a problem. And these actually look like parabolas that just jump back and forth. You'll see they happen um, for your cosecant. Those parabolas happen at the peak and the valleys of your sines. Your, co your secants happen at the peaks and valleys of your cosines. Looks like parabolas that happen at the peaks and valleys. And so I'm not going to make you graph these and shift these, but I want you to be aware of what happens to your tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant graph in relationship to your sine and cosine graphs, all right? They actually um, cycle along with them, but these do have undefined areas.